so I'm going to read a selection from the broadsheet, The Cream of the Milk, which is a collection of Clary Hughes about famous and infamous Irish women. I'm going to do, I'm going to celebrate six women tonight and tell you some sort of stories, I suppose, about their uh, lives uh, after uh, presenting the, the Clary Hugh. And we will have uh, a break then about between numbers three and four, at which time if people want to have a, a, a little uh, a refreshment or walk around or don't, don't leave because there's more to come and we will have the um, opportunity if anybody wants to buy. There's only a few copies uh, of the broadsheet left. Okay, um, Miss Eileen Gray snubbed Le Corbusier when she saw the sexy heaven he left on the walls of E1027. Eileen Gray is shown there in typically elegant pose. I should say that the, um, the illustrations on the broadsheet were done by Alan Nolan. You see how he's captured so well the, the beauty of her, of her hand and indeed of her, of her face. He's also included the Bibendum chair, which was one of her most witty uh, furniture designs. It was designed for the house known as one, E1027. And she used, the, the chair was inspired by the Michelin man, the, the um, advertising figure for tires, which you may have seen as a sort of an old French advertisement, very charming. And the Michelin, the Bibendum chair was also named in, in Eileen's spirit of sort of uh, conviviality, it was named for, um, named with a quotation from Horace, which is, let us be drinking, is the translation of Bibendum. So I'm going to say more about E1027 in a minute, but just to explain the, the name of it, it was the house she built on the, uh, in the south of France, just east of Nice, and the code for the house was that E is obviously for Eileen. 10 is the 10th letter of the alphabet for Jean. And uh, 2 is the second letter of the alphabet for Badovici, who was Eileen's lover at the time and the man for whom, in a sense, she designed the house. And 7 is um, Gray. So it's Eileen and Jean in the name of the, in the, name of the house. Um, Eileen Gray was born uh, uh, near Enniscorthy in County Wexford in 1878 and she moved at a young age, at probably 16, to the Slade School of, uh, School of Art in London and thence to Paris where she had a very successful career making very special furniture for the, uh, the haute bourgeoisie of uh, Paris of the time. She had a very important experience in 1905 in Dean Street in London. She stumbled quite by chance on a lacquer workshop and walked in and asked to be taken on as a worker to learn how to make lacquer. And that was something that was hardly known in the West and she was um, very expert at it after studying in London, but also she brought from Japan uh, a man called Sugawara who was her associate and did a great deal of the work. And her lacquer screens uh, in the 1970s became a huge sellers on the international art market. They're wonderful uh, designs, uh, art deco kind of designs and with the expertise of the lacquer. Eileen um, didn't want to continue uh, just making one-off pieces of furniture for wealthy people. So she turned with great courage, because she wasn't formally trained, she turned away from her shop, which was Jean Désert in Paris, and embarked on uh, um, uh, designing a house for herself and for Jean in the south of France. Um, they, they, this is um, the house at Rough Broom, and you can see that it's uh, sort of 100 feet above the water, the land is very cut off. You can't drive to the place. I can vouch for having to walk along a very narrow and uh, sort of a dusty road to it. And here she designed a house 
with the aid of models, because she wasn't even trained in, in making architectural drawings, but she decided to try and make a house that had for her the essence of modern, of modern design and modern architecture. And there's all sorts of extraordinary folding and sliding and pivoting pieces of furniture in it. And as you can see there, it's got a nautical kind of look to it, very horizontal with terraces. And she was so ingenious because her terrace uh, could be closed if there was stormy weather, which they do get sometimes in the south of France. And then you could use the other terrace that was on the land side. Uh, she also eschewed making a little pool because of mosquitoes. Instead of that, she had a lovely idea, a, a trough filled with sand in which people could immerse their feet. Her, 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 she built it between 1926 and 1929. It took a very long time because everything had to be carried in uh, physically by, by, by hand to uh, build it. It was, it was excited some interest and in 19... 38, Le Corbusier, who she looked on as a mentor and a very important influence, and who was publishing in Jean de Badovici's um, magazine, uh, she, she, in, she allowed him to use the, apart the uh, villa when she wasn't there. And that was where the episode referred to in my Clarihue started, which was that uh, Corbusier was very given to playful, what he thought playful pranks. And he decided, he was also quite opinionated about the house and sort of a bit ambivalent perhaps about Eileen as a, as a, as a woman and non-formally trained. Uh, anyway, he altered the, egg, the entrance to her house, which she had carefully designed to be revealed bit by bit. Instead of that, he closed up one of her doors. And what is more notorious, and what I refer to, is she, he covered one wall with garish and somewhat obscene uh, cartoons and drawings. And she was not amused. She was a, a refined lady. And um, he dismissed it as saying that he'd now made the house more interesting. If you just look to the slightly to the right there, uh, on your, on your uh, looking, looking to your right in the picture, you will see the cabanon, which was the little cabin that Corbusier built for himself, where he did a lot of work in a very, very uh, strictly uh, measured uh, space. And it was from these rocks that, tragically, he was swimming when he had a heart attack and, and died. Eileen went on to do other houses. She was very influenced by the De Stiel movement in Holland, and she um, practiced architecture and design until her death in, 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 uh, in 1976 at the age of 98. And her, her, her fame has gone through several cycles of neglect, but I think she's firmly established now as a very important uh, designer. A very big contrast is Nora Barnacle, but interestingly enough, Nora and James Joyce were living in Paris at the same time when Eileen was in Paris for so long that presumably she was there all the time. But the circles in which they moved could well have overlapped, but there's no record of them having met each other. Nora Barnacle, never Joyce, said, Jim, you make the choice. I'll baptise the kids if you stay on the drink. No need for a font. I'll head for the sink. If Eileen is refined, one would probably say that Nora was earthy. Nora Barnacle was born in 1884 in, in, in um, Galway, and she had uh, an upbringing in the town with a sort of a fairly prosperous family of bakers. But when she was, uh, she was a very uh, independent and unconventional girl, very vivacious from an early age. And she was inclined to dress as a boy and go out at night where she had more freedom to wander the streets. On one occasion, her uncle, one of her uncles whom she was living with at the time, beat her because she was going out with a Protestant. And she just took off to Dublin. And there she famously took a job as a chambermaid in Finn's Hotel, which is just round the corner from us here in Clare Street. 
And equally, even more famously, one evening she was walking along Clare Street and so was the young James Joyce. She was 20 and he was 22. And on their second date, the way he described it was, she made a man of him. They walked out towards Ring's End and that date was, of course, the 16th of June, 1904, later immor immortalised in, in, in Ulysses. Almost immediately after that, I, don't, I can't remember how long, but in a matter of months, they eloped to Trieste, and there they embarked on a very um, precarious and cosmopolitan life, which brought Nora so far from her origins and so far from her uh, initial family which she took with great aplomb. Nora was fond of opera and fashion. There are stories about them that when they were totally broke, getting into a cab and driving around the city to find a hat that Nora particularly liked. She mastered Italian, German, and French. And of course, she met uh, the, the, the great of the period, the great writers like Pound, Beckett, but also Yeats and Jung. Um, there, the, the, when the, when uh, Joyce's father heard her surname, he, his comment was, she never leave him because of the barnacle. And so she didn't. They remained extremely devoted, even though they had their ups and downs, as my, my Clary who refers to the fact that Joyce's taste for white wine was, was uh, it caused a difficulty for them. Um, and you could say that their children hardly knew which nationality they were. But Joyce was certainly determined that they would not be baptised as Catholics. But she was able, she, she was always very independent and well able to argue her case. Uh, she kept her, her own personality in it all. Um, Nora was, had a, an interesting attitude to Joyce's own work. She referred to him sometimes as simple minded Jim, which probably outrages his admirers. But she listened to him writing. And she heard him laughing and laughing as he was composing, and that sort of endeared her to um, the writing, which in one level she believed he would, would have been better to stick to the singing. It certainly might have brought in a more regular income in their early years. Interestingly enough, she preferred Finnegan's Wake to Ulysses. And of course, she is regarded as the inspiration of Greta Conroy, of Molly Bloom, and of Anna Livia. She was really indispensable in Joyce's life. Just to recount the, briefly the cities they lived in, they first eloped to Trieste, then they lived in Rome, then Trieste again, back briefly to Dublin, to Zurich, to Trieste again, to Paris, and finally um, uh, uh, to Zurich again, where, as you know, they both died. Uh, Nora didn't die till 1951, but she's buried beside Joyce in that, in that city. This is uh, the Nora Barnacle Museum in Galway, which has kind of recently opened, and this is the sort of milieu that I suppose is reproduced that Nora would have, would have grown up in. And uh, again, a far cry from the uh, European cities where she travelled. Lady Jane Wilde laboured to bear a dauntless child and foresaw that Oscar's stanzas would eclipse Speranza's. Jane Francesca Elgy, who became Lady Jane Wilde when she married Sir William Wilde, lived just round the corner from Finn's Hotel in number one, well, across the street, in fact, in number one, Merrion Square, with her husband, Sir William Wilde, and the, um, and the two sons, uh, Willie and Oscar, and their daughter, Isola. It's interesting about the baptisms because Lady Wilde, uh, in her phase of uh, ardent nationalism and her sympathy with the Irish people after the famine, during the famine, she actually wanted to have her son, she wanted to baptise her sons as Roman Catholics. And so William had no objection so in a sense, she was the reverse of, of Nora Barnacle in that, in that way. Uh, Jane Francesca Elgy was born to a middle-class, uh, well-to-do Protestant family in County Wexford. She 
uh, grew, as she was growing up, in, at first she was indifferent to the plight of the poor who lived around the, the, the um, house. But with, uh, with, with the growth of uh, the emigration, the typhoid, and all the other ailments that followed uh, the famine, she set about uh, responding with a very, a very fiery rhetoric. And uh, she wrote poems that were blaming and denouncing the British government for all the, all the ills of the, of the famine and the, and the problems. And they were published in the Nation newspaper, which was the newspaper of the Young Irelanders, um, uh, edited by uh, Charles Gavin Duffy. She wrote one anonymous leading article, which was regarded as seditious, and Charles Gavin Duffy was brought to court, at which point uh, Jane, uh, with, with the talent for bravado and, and indeed the courage, but also the, the liking for the theatrical, she stood up in the, in the public gallery of the court and said, it was I who wrote the, the article, not Charles Gavin Duffy, to charge me with sedition, but they didn't. And they even let Charles Gavin Duffy off as well. Uh, she had a very happy marriage to Sir William Wilde. Uh, they were both quite high-minded and they had common interests in folklore and he was a, a no, known antiquarian and did a great deal of work in the west of Ireland on Moitura and the uh, prehistoric um, um, monuments. Um, she was very influenced also by uh, she, she was quite influential on W.B. Yeats in her writings about folklore, and she edited Sir, Wi Sir William's uh, papers. She ran a literary salon on Saturday afternoons, and there would be up to a hundred of the most famous um, uh, people of Dublin, the, the people from the political, artistic, and uh, musical world came. One of her uh, guests described her as full of nonsense with a sprinkling of genius, which just about captures her. And her, her life was strangely marked by um, lawsuits. I've mentioned the trial for sedition. But then there was the episode of Mary Travers, who was a sort of on-off mistress of Sir William, one of many mistresses that he had. And Mary Travers took very much against Jane Wilde and did what we would now call stalking, which was to um, follow her, uh, put nasty comments in the paper about her, have the newsboys shout her name out on street corners and so on. And Jane Wilde, uh, in, a, in a, an eerie anticipation of Oscar's libel case, went to court against Mary Travers. Mary Travers actually won, but she was given damages of one farthing, which was fairly well saying that her reputation wasn't uh, prized very highly. Um, Lady Jane Wilde was high-minded, somewhat guileless and, and really good-hearted good or big-hearted. She bore with certain uh, fortitude the numerous affairs of Sir William, and indeed, when his, she was sort of above any, anything so uh, mundane. She was too lofty to take issue with, with his numerous mistresses. In fact, she allowed one of them to sit with him when he was dying, which was again her, her, her generous sort of soul. She might have felt a little bit differently though when the will was read and it was revealed that every single thing he owned was mortgaged and they were basically penniless. The other sadness in her life was the death of her daughter Isola who died at the age of nine, their only daughter, and all the family were absolutely heartbroken. Isola is buried in Mount Jerome Cemetery, and there's a few lines of Oscars on, on the uh, gravestone, which are very uh, beautiful. Tread lightly, she is here under the snow. Speak gently, she can hear the lilies grow. After the death of Isola, Jane grew both fatter and more and more sad. And considering she was six feet tall, she made quite an imposing figure. In this period, she uh, favored a great many cameos, brooches, necklaces, and other appendages. And this is a cartoon of her by George Morosini at this period. 
She held her salons now in a darkened room because she was embarrassed at her, at the large size and the fact that she was, um, you know, sort of, a, she was so stricken with, with grief at, after Isola. She always believed strongly in her, in her sons and uh, in the case of Oscar particularly, she proclaimed that he would turn out something wonderful. Um, she moved to London shortly before he did uh, when, they were, when she had found that she had no money left from Sir William's estate. And there she lived in a sort of Dickensian uh, descent from one shabbier house to another. When Oscar's uh, trial, uh, when Oscar's fall came and his, he was facing trial, she was said she would never speak to him again if he didn't face the trial, that he was an Irish gentleman and must not uh, shrink um, she, it must not be a, a res a respectable, that they were above respectability. And this was again part of her rather extravagant uh, image of herself and the family. It seems that she was sort of unaware of exactly what his crime was, or perhaps, as was the decorum of the time, she wouldn't have been uh, ready to uh, discuss it. But she certainly uh, backed him up. Unfortunately, she never met him after the trial because he was in jail and she died and is buried in Kensal Green uh, Cemetery. I just wanted to say a couple of things about where this broadsheet came from. Um, I was, a few years ago, I was about, what, about a year and a half ago, I was sitting in number 32 Westland Row, the home of the Oscar Wilde Centre for Creative Writing, and Professor Gerard Doe, whom I was talking to, mentioned that this was the very room in which Oscar was born. And something made me think of Jane and her labouring and giving birth to Oscar and so on. And that's where the idea of celebrating women who outgrew the sort of prescribed roles that were, they were given at, at birth and stretched well beyond the, the time and the place where they were born. And they were all adventurers and I want to celebrate them. And that is the 13 women who are in the broadsheet. When I set out to do the Clary Hughes, I was fascinated by these women and I felt them sort of at my elbow almost. Some of them were cranky, some of them were exuberant, all of them were pretty pushy. And they were, as, as um, my, uh, um, my brother-in-law Reg said, all fair and none middling. Dr. James Barry had a secret to carry. Many remarked on his slender frame. None knew his only male trait was his name. Dr. James Barry, was born as Mary Ann Bulkley in Cork. And even though I use the uh, masculine pronoun in the Clary Hugh, I'm going to use the feminine pronoun tonight because she was Mary Ann. Uh, she was born, uh, it's not quite clear when, but the date that's generally agreed on by her biographer, June Rose, is 1792. She was born in Cork, but her mother uh, took her and her sister at a very early stage to London. The mother was in some sort of difficulty. Again, it's, it, the details are very scanty about all this. The mother was a relation of the very famous Irish painter James Barry, who was an academician, but also a somewhat prickly and touchy soul who quarrelled with, uh, with, uh, with the other famous painters and was considered a bit of a, a firebrand. Through his influence, uh, the mother met some uh, powerful figures, including a Venezuelan war hero called General Miranda and another uh, aristocratic uh, gentleman who were all influenced by the thinking of Mary Wollstonecraft and believed that women should have a greater destiny than was prescribed, which was if they were poor to be a governess, if they were lucky to marry somebody who could support them. And he particularly fixed, General Miranda, I think, particularly fixed on the younger of uh, Mrs. Barry's, or uh, Miss Barry's uh, daughters. 
that was uh, Mary Ann. The child showed remarkable promise and particularly a great interest in science. So this, the wheeze that they dreamt up was a daring in the extreme. It was to enroll her in, the, in Edinburgh University and to study medicine under the name of James Barry. She took the name of her, or of her painter uncle. She alleged that she was only 10, which was a way to get over the absence of the Adam's apple and the squeaky voice and the tiny frame. Now, apparently people could go and study medicine at 10 uh, at that time. Um, but she was probably more like 15. Again, the details are very, very scanty. And the amount of secrecy that had to prevail, I suppose, made, made it even more uh, difficult to establish facts. But she passed with flying colors through her medical uh, studies. And she joined the Ar Army Medical Corps. Not one would have thought the obvious place to hide if you were a woman masquerading as a man, but that's what she did. She served for a while in Britain, and then she moved to the Cape Colony, which is now what we would call South Africa. She was known as a dancer, a dainty figure, and cut a fine figure in her uniform, as you can see there. Um, she was also a duelist, though I think the duel was actually called off, but it showed her sparkle and her determination that she did challenge somebody to a duel who, as they say, cast dispersions on her practice. She was an absolute stickler <coughs> for hygiene at a time when that was looked on, including by the medical profession, as a rather quaint, eccentric way to look at things, like washing your hands or, or cleaning the, the beds on which people had died. She also was extremely progressive because she spoke up for the common soldiers, the lepers, the lunatics, the families of people who were ill, and she made herself a presence, sometimes a thorn in the side of the authorities. But again, she had a powerful protector. Her lover appears to have been Sir Charles Somerset, who was the governor of the Cape. One of the most uh, famous moments in her career in, in South Africa was when she found a mother for whom a caesarean was indicated. And caesareans had not been performed in modern times and in Britain or I think anywhere else. Again, it's not totally clear that she was about the second, if not the first, caesarean which succeeded in saving the life of both mother and child. And indeed the child was later christened Barry and his godson, also Barry, became uh, a governor of South Africa in, in later periods. She was posted to several uh, parts of the Mediterranean in the service of the crown, again rising all the time, being promoted, in spite of her uh, very cranky and um, uh, hot-tempered uh, manner. She, her, her expertise was recognized. She was posted to Malta, where again she talked about public sanitation might actually help to get rid of the typhus. And she was appointed Inspector General of British Hospitals, which was the highest rank that a, a soldier could attain in the, in, the medical, uh, in the medical field. In the Crimea, where she was posted, she clashed, not surprisingly, with Florence Nightingale. They were both quite um, opinionated and uh, uh, um, bossy and believed in their own uh, judgment. And, uh, but in fact, she had many things in common because for one thing she believed that women of uh, respectable women and women with a little education and commitment should become nurses rather than the drunken and uh, uh, illiterate women who were serving as nurses in the main at the time. After being so long in very warm climates, it was quite cruel of the, of the um, authorities to post her to Canada because she contracted uh, bronchitis and her health was quite compromised. She finally returned to London where she lived in Marylebone and strangely succumbed to dysentery, which was rife in London in, at the time, meaning that she had survived so many outbreaks of fevers in, in, in hotter places, but she died in London. She had been uh, slated for a military funeral but the plans for that were abandoned when rumour spread that she wasn't a man, but a woman. The woman who was laying her out vouched for the fact that she was female and what's more, she had possibly borne a child. A 
again a matter of some discussion in the, in the literature, but our biographer, Joan, June Rose, does uh, 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 support that view. So her, she was denied a military funeral, which was a, a, a little sadness for her, uh, presumably for her, that she didn't have that final honour. There was a connection with Lady Wilde, which I forgot to mention earlier. I mentioned that when Lady Wilde grew very fat and was self-conscious, she preferred her salon to happen in sort of semi-darkness. And of course, Dr. Barry was examined by colleagues. Again, some young colleagues vouched for her femaleness, but they always examined her at her insistence in a darkened room. In her last years, in her last years, she was accompanied by a servant called John from West, the West Indies, whom she had met at her stay in Jamaica. And there she is uh, with her faithful dog, Psyche. And they both moved with her to London and were her companions till the, till the end of her life. Growing a whale, fierce under sail, chased English ships for profit and sport, till Elizabeth called her to answer at court. If Lady Jane Wilde was guileless and good-hearted, and Dr. Barry was progressive and somewhat um, spiky in manner, I suppose you would describe Gronya Whale as above all pragmatic. Gronya Whale, or Grace O'Malley, was born around 1530. So many of them, it's, it's around when they were born. We don't have their exact date. She was uh, heir and uh, daughter to the O'Malley, the chieftain O'Malley, who was one of the four Gaelicized Norman families, the Joyces, the O'Malleys, the O'Flaherty's, and the Burks, which held sway all over the west of Ireland at the time. Um, at age 16, she was betrothed to Donal O'Flaherty, who was the heir to the O'Flaherty title. He, was, he seemed to have been somewhat inept as a seafarer, compared with her, and she very quickly took over his fleet of galleys and his business, which was to sack and pillage boats and to take ransom and also to exact uh, license, uh, to, uh, to insist on licenses from other shipping. And she practiced her trade as sea captain and pirate um, uh, all over the Southwest, uh, the Southwest Mayo. And she built then a move to a tower house on Clare Island, which any of you have been to Clare Island, you've probably seen. Unfortunately, or whatever, uh, Donal was murdered at quite an early stage, and she then married uh, Richard on Iran, Richard the Iron of Burke, and his terrain was Clue Bay. I think on her marriage, she had three. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm wrong. She had three, three children with uh, the first husband, Donald O'Flaherty, and one with Richard. Um, but she, she and Richard divorced. She actually divorced him. Under Breton law, women could divorce, could initiate a divorce. They could inherit their own property. They could command ships. They could drink alcohol. They had a very good deal, um, which somehow we seem to, seem to have disappeared somewhere along the way. But she was able, with her deal with, with Richard, to keep Rockfleet, which was the castle that had come to her uh, at her marriage. And she was uh, drove a very hard bargain, but herself and Richard remained strategically allies, even though they were, were no longer married. Um, Grace continued then with her career of plundering ships, and in fact, she was sort of tolerated until the Tudors began to aim to spread their influence more into the west of Ireland as they had established it over the, over the er, eastern part of the country. And she, was, uh, she met her match in the governor, Richard Bingham, who in 1584 was appointed governor of Connacht. And he took her lands. He was trying to infiltrate the Gaelic lords and win them to the, the cause of, of um, Elizabeth, uh, the first of uh, the, the queen, and he challenged Grace and took possession of her lands. And he also arrested her son, Tibbet Nalong, who was sort of the apple of her eye, her son with Richard. She decided to um, 
confront uh, Queen Elizabeth, and though I say Elizabeth called her to answer at court, it's not quite clear which of them called which. But there is a rather charming contemporary uh, illustration of the meeting. And I think it's fascinating. Uh, Grace sailed up the Thames to London, and here she is on the, on, on the left, uh, somewhat more weather-beaten, hair packed up on her head, standing in a wool uh, cloak and a linen uh, dress. And Elizabeth I on the right is sitting uh, with her, her red wig full of jewels and brocades and her black smile from her rather uh, famously rotten teeth, her white makeup. But she's obviously, both of them were astute, both of them were charismatic, and both of them were, were planning on increasing their power. The only common language they had, of course, was Latin, but however Grace succeeded in, in uh, speaking to Elizabeth, she did um, uh, have restitution of both her lands and her son was released, so she achieved her objective. However, uh, when she got back, uh, there was still difficulty with Bingham, but conveniently enough for Grace, Bingham was later disgraced and brought to the Tower of London. It seemed to happen quite a lot to people that they were one moment um, on the crest of the wave and then suddenly struck down. Though she was described by the English uh, uh, authorities as the nurse of all rebellions, Grace was actually took a very pragmatic view. She took hospitality from the O'Neill and the O'Donnell during uh, 1586 when they were planning their rebellion and their last stand as Gaelic lords. However, when their, uh, when their rebellion was unsuccessful, uh, she actually had a part in that. She encouraged Tibbet Nalong and her other son Morrow to act against them. And uh, her son, she saw her son made the first Viscount Mayo. So Grace was really less interested in standing up for um, the old Gaelic order uh, which came to an end in her time, or indeed for the remnants of the Norman power, rather than, above all, what she was interested in is establishing a, a lineage and a, and a, a line of uh, powerful uh, descendants, and that she did. <laughs> unaware, her love for Tristan a tale of wonder, his hazel tree, her honeysuckle, no blade could sunder. We're now in mythology, in the, la in the, in the, in the era of mythology folks, so dates don't arise one way or the other. Um, the legend of Tristan and Isolt uh, has been uh, hugely uh, Feature, featured in many European, in much European literature, the troubadour poetry, Wagner's opera, of course, and before that it was the stuff of what was called the Matter of Britain, the Arthurian legends, which talked about uh, a single world between England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and Brittany. Why am I mentioning that tonight? Well, it just seems that things are, things are shifting again. King Mark of Cornwall was uh, quite of quite mature years, and one day he saw a bird with a single strand of golden hair in its beak, and he vowed that he would marry, he would marry only the woman from whose head that hair had come. And it was identified as belonging to Isolt of Ireland, the daughter of King Anguish, strangely named, and another Isolt, her mother. And like her mother, she was a skilled physician and healer. And King Mark sent his most uh, worthy and, uh, I think, person of a knight called Tristan to bring Isolt back uh, to be his bride. Uh, her mother, mindful of the age of King Mark and the difference between their ages, actually brewed up a potion which was to be kept and given to King Mark on his wedding night. Unfortunately, there was some sort of mix-up on the ship, 
and whether by accident or design, Esau's lady in waiting presented it to Tristan and Esau as if it was wine. They fell madly in love and they had to um, uh, flee because King Mar Mark's wrath. I think they made different versions of the love triangle uh, are, 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 are found. In some versions they did sort of carry on a, a surreptitious affair. In others it was just by the sea passage, which was probably a lengthy enough one to Cornwall. Anyway, Mark took his revenge on Tristan. He had Esau sent back uh, to Ireland, but he, he banished Mark to Brittany. And there Tristan, who seems to have had a bit of a one-track mind, married Esau of the White Hands, uh, another princess of Brittany. And in later years, he fell ill of a poisoned wound. And on his bed, uh, he asked, uh, could they send for Esau of Ireland? Because only she, as the physician, could heal him. Um, in a story that has also echoes in Greek mythology, with Theseus and Aegeus, uh, he said, if she was coming, she should raise a white sail. And if she wasn't coming, the boat should have a black one. He asked his wife, he was too weak to go to the window of his tower, so he asked his wife to look out and see whether the sail was white or black. You can guess what happened. He sort of the white hand said, no, no, it's a black sail. And Tristan died heartbroken. King Mark seemed to have relented by then and he had them be uh, buried in Cornwall. And he allowed, and out of her uh, grave grew a honeysuckle, and out of his a hazel tree, and they twined together. It seems that Mark con continued to have them cut down, um, you had the trees cut, but he couldn't stop them growing and growing back together. So the, the phrase that the troubadours use is, me vous sans moi, me moi sans vous. Me, not me without you, and not you without me. The final image is interesting in its own right. Herbert Draper was the pre-Raphaelite painter. And this painting was made in 1901. And it's sort of, Esau is not blonde, though she was famed for being blonde, but she's a black-haired. And you can see the scene on the ship, the people rowing, the, the lady in waiting asleep, and the dreaded goblet, which is now empty, with the potion all gone. Unfortunately, that painting actually disappeared and was destroyed in, in, during the Second World War. So this image is all we have of it now. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>